All right then, if you have your Bibles, we ask you to turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 8. We're going to begin reading this evening in the first verse. The Gospel of John chapter 8. The Bible says in the first verse, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they that heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. And he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your holy word tonight. Uh, we thank you how you've protected it across the centuries that tonight we might look in on it, that we might uh, glean uh, your person from it, Lord, that we might understand and know who you are better today than we did yesterday. Lord, bless your word to those that are here tonight. and We be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for them all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. I've preached on it myself numerous times, but the more I study it and the more I preach on it, the more I see uh, about the attitude of man and about the attitude of Christ and how different they really are and how extraordinary it is that we have a Savior that forgives us. Now, uh, and we also see the self-righteousness and hypocrisy that every one of us holds. That everyone has a part of us that thinks they're better than the other person or thinks they're doing things in a better way. And that, that is kind of sums up uh, what occurs on this occasion. Now, in the first verse, the Bible says, And Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Now, uh, uh, he was going to a place where he could teach them. And uh, uh, he, if you'll read uh, chapter 7, he did quite an amount of teaching and preaching. And he needed a break. And he, uh, and, and he kind of escaped or receded or went to rest at the Mount of Olives. Now, we see the humanity of Christ in that, in that time and time again, he had human needs that had to be met. In other words, he was, he was clothed in our flesh. The Bible says uh, verbatim, he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He got hungry, he got tired, uh, but more than that, when we openly sin and we treat others badly, we cannot say that Christ didn't understand. Now, he understood what we were made of, and he chose to be kind. He, he chose to be good. He chose to be considerate. So the only uh, flip side that we come to when we don't, when we're nasty, when we're, uh, when we're short, and when we shout at people, the only thing that we can come to is that's a choice too. Uh, we choose to handle things uh, in the way that we do. 
So he's rested up now, verse 2, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple, and all the people came unto him and sat down and taught them. Now I want you to notice in verse 2 specifically, the, the, groups that, that, the group that is there and the group that's not there, at least not yet. The group that came were the unlearned. The group that uh, came had an affinity and an interest in Christ, and the groups that would come just in a moment, all they ever did was seek a way to kill Christ, to seek a way to take Christ away, to seek uh, to minimize his ministry, whatever they could do, those would come in a minute, but the first group that had an interest in the things of God came first. It just says, and the people came to them, to, to him. And you kind of have to look at yourself speculatively, and which group would you have been in? Which group would, would you be the ones that we're going to see that uh, made a spectacle out of this woman? Or would you be the one that came with a sincerity to listen? Verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. Now, uh, a lot could go into that, and a lot of imagination could get away, but one thing we do know for sure is that the man was never dealt with. Now, just as much as it is a sin for a woman to take up another man, it is just as clearly as a sin uh, as it is for the woman, it is for the man. And so we find that he's never mentioned. And you can think, well, did they just turn him loose? Did they just let him go? Or maybe it was one of them. Maybe it was one of the very individuals that brought him forward. I mean, that brought her forward. Who knows? But we do know this, that they were treated very differently. And that is the first example we find in the context uh, of this, these verses is how differently people are treated then and how differently people are treated even today. And often, sadly enough, we're guilty of that ourselves. So the man got loose and the woman was drug in. And the individuals that uh, drug her in were supposed to be the spiritually elite. Now, their problem was this. They weren't spiritually elite. They were doctrinally elite. In other words, they knew the Scripture inside and out, but they had no compassion. They had no spirituality about them. They had no interest in mankind. They had no interest in the way that, uh, the way that things should be. They just wanted to be self-righteous. And that, and that was their nature, and that's who they were. And they brought this poor woman in on the note of concern, but what they really wanted to do is take another punch at Christ. Now, uh, that's another thing you can think about when we get into some of these things, such as uh, letting one go and, and trapping the other, what would the Lord Jesus Christ do in the same situation? What would be his approach? Um, and the scribes and the Pharisees, verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman in, taken in adultery, and when they set her in the midst, in the very middle of what was going on, they say unto him, Master, which is teacher, and say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, my question is this. How did they know? <laughs> Sounds like they weren't looking for to me. Looking for him, too, apparently. Uh, you know, they, they had to have some inclination of this. And instead of helping those poor, two poor individuals doing what they were, in imparting some knowledge of, uh, of the Bible to them, imparting some knowledge of the law, they drug one of them out and brought them, and brought them her before and not both of them. Um, you ever uh, thought about, huh, uh, I, I preached a sermon one time on this, uh, I think it was at South Road, and as you know, I didn't last there very long. 
Uh, and the title of the sermon was, What Are You Doing When You're Missing Church? And you can imagine why that went over good. And, uh, but that's the same thing. They were having a meeting down at the, uh, down at the temple, and they were out trying to find a woman taken in the, out of adul- uh, in the act of adultery. If they'd been where they're supposed to be and focused on Jesus, none of this would have never happened. And I think a lot of times our biggest problem when we see instances like this, and it don't have to be as horrid as adultery, it could be just uh, uh, somebody wearing something and, or maybe uh, somebody doing something that we don't necessarily approve of. Instead of praying for them, we become tail bearers. Yeah. And I'm not talking about prayer requests. I'm talking tail bearers. And, and, and so we see... That was the attitude of these religious people. Verse 5. Now Moses, they bring up the law. Now Moses in the law commanded uh, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Now this was really a twofold question. First of all, I want you to see the lack of compassion. You know what's the problem with the Lord's churches today is a lack of compassion. They had no interest in this woman's spirituality. They had no interest in this woman's health. They did, literally did not care if she lived or died. It was all to uh, see if they could bring Christ to the Lord. Now Christ, you know, being the very living Son of God, it shows how foolish they were and had little understanding of the being of Christ that he that was they thought that he was going to get them caught somehow in a trick bag and so uh, they knew he was a loving man and so they didn't think that he would stone her but if he didn't stone her he wasn't following the law So they really thought that they had a very good opportunity to outsmart the very living Son of God. And we all know how that transpired and fell out. But I want you to see how insignificant they felt like that woman was. You you ever walked by anybody and uh, thought that they were insignificant? I I dare say if... uh, if we'd be honest at one time or another, we've all done that. Um, you know, uh, and it's not as bad now. I guess maybe Clarks will uh, set down in a little bit, but there used to be a lot of bums that would ask for money up there in Clarksville. Um, I remember when you had to go to Nashville to find that. And uh, my first inclination was get up and go to work. And then the Lord would chide me for that. And, uh, you know, I, I would be reminded, I have no idea what brought them to this situation. Uh, I, I have no understanding. You know what? If I give them a dollar or two and they run and get a, a, a bottle of beer, that's on them. But I, ha- I, have, I have to show the compassion of Christ. Yeah. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people sometimes get in the situation of the Jews and we make a very quick uh, snap decision on what is right and what is wrong and the result is uh, we often get um, we lack the compassion that we need verse 6 this they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him but Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not now uh, as you all know, and I've said time and time again, I would love to know um, what he wrote. Uh, there's no record of that. We have no understanding of that. Uh, but, uh, and I don't know that we ever will. When we get to glory, I don't know if that will become insignificant. I always thought if I could speak to the Lord directly, it would be one thing uh, I would like to know about. Did he write, forgiven? Or did he write, uh, uh, did he write, uh, uh, hypocrite? What, what did he write? That's a very interesting thought to me. But it comes down to this, it doesn't really matter. Uh, because what he did was, uh, give them time 
as the old saying goes, to stew in their own juices. Uh, we all have our issues, do we not? From me to the youngest person under the sound of my voice to the redeemed and the lost alike, we all have our issues, do we not? Yeah. And certainly there's no position for us to start uh, casting stones. To, to belittle someone, to, to bring them down. And you know what? I've not only seen this among the Lord's people, I've seen them joy in it, which is a, which is a very concerning thing to me. Verse 7. So when they continued, in other words, they kept badgering him. They kept asking him. They kept saying, what are we going to do with her? He lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Now, in, in this one very short statement, the Lord God in heaven, the Lord in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, says you're all guilty. Every one of us, there's guilt. Uh, somehow, and I've never quite understood this. I think when you begin to truly understand the grace of God as you get older, all that pride begins to slip away. Uh, you quit looking down your nose at people and realize what you really have to do is look up at them. And so he gives them the verdict of the law and says, yeah, you can do that if you've never sinned yourself. It also teaches us very clearly there's no gradient to sin. And this is a hard one for all of us at times, but one, one sin in the eyes of the Almighty God Jehovah is just as black as the other. Now, uh, we, we would think that, that adultery or sodomy is somehow far worse than stealing or, or lying or something like that, but according to the Word of God, in the view of the eye of the Almighty, it's all the black and ungodly and deserves punishment. And yet, and still, He never did. Christ never once about... He, can you imagine a being so holy that He never even had one evil thought? That, that is beyond my perception. I, I, I can't, I, maybe it's because I compare it to myself. I don't know. But I cannot imagine an individual that holy. But he was. And then in that state, he says, okay, who, whichever one of you never sinned, you cast, you cast all the stones you want. Now, in that, who then left had the only right to cast the first stone? the Lord Jesus Christ. He kept the law. He kept it to every jot and tittle according to the, uh, what the Bible says about him. And he could have, but he didn't. That's compassion. That, that, that's the love that ought to be illustrated by each of us. So he makes that statement. He presents that directive. And then in verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And again, Mystery to me, wonderful knowledge if I ever get it, what he wrote the second time. Verse 9. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. Now, I, I think this is noteworthy. A couple of things about it. First of all, they did have an active conscience. Now, in the modern day, I think that's something that is slowly fading away. When you can kill 15 or 16 people and never bat an eye, uh, I don't think you have any moral compass at all. And I don't mean the redeemed. You know, it was a time in, in my life, in 53 years, when the most wicked sinner you knew had a moral, an inner moral compass, and there were some things they just wouldn't do. That's gone. Uh, you look at some people, multi-murderers, multi-rapists, and it's just a blank slate. There's nothing there. And, and, and these individuals, these Jews, despite their spiritual condition, which I think every one of them was lost, they had an inner moral compass that said, you know what? 
I've done just as much. I've sinned, and therefore I'm guilty. You know, uh, it's an amazing thing when people get to that point, isn't it? Uh, it, it, it also amazes me equally that we come to a point that that don't even figure in, that that's just not even part uh, of our society anymore. And so they heard the message. They were convicted by their own conscience, not by the Holy Ghost, and went out one by one, being at the eldest, even unto the last. Now I think that's significant that the eldest one left first. And I think there, there are probably two reasons why. First of all, was maturity. And the second reason, I believe, listen, the list just gets longer the longer you live. And so he understood that he was an entity against God. And so he left. The oldest man there probably thought he was better than the rest of them headed out, and then one by one, even, and usually to be in the temple, in the Pharisee, Sadducees uh, priest uh, realm, you at least had to be 25, 26. And they finally had all left. You, you know, the word of God and, and the conviction by the law, and again, this was their own moral compass. This was not the Holy Ghost convicting. Like, the, you know, uh, 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 when Lydia was saved in Acts 16, it said, whose heart the Lord opened. It wasn't that reaction. It was just an inner moral compass that said, yeah, I've sinned. Uh, I've let God down. I've sinned against him. And, and so each of them left because they knew each of them were equally convicted as this woman. And so they left. Verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but their, none but the woman, and I think it is significant there too concerning the woman. She didn't leave. Everybody else had left, all her accusers. Now, if we'd be honest and, and, and realistic in the, law, in the eyes of the law, what would you have done? The whole crowd gone? Jesus sitting there doing something like this? Most of us would have tucked tail and run, right? Run while the running's good. So she had an experience that made her understand who she was. That whether she tucked tail and run or she st stood in front of the Son of God, she was still guilty. You know when the Lord begins to work on your heart is when you begin to understand and know that you're guilty in, in lieu of this book. And this event brought it to pass, so she knowing, knowing now that she was guilty, she stood before him and waited. Verse 11, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, I want you to notice two things. And I always think of the Samaritan woman when I read this. And, um, you know, she'd gone up there to get her some water in the middle of the afternoon. And she had this encounter with Jesus. And it, it went pretty good. It went like a Southern Baptist meeting until he said, Go get your husband. And she said, well, I ain't got a husband. You well said. <laughs> because you've had five husbands. And the one that you're with now is not your husband and that you have well said. And uh, number one, that shows us what the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows all our little, our little idiosyncrasies and he knows how they work. And so 
I think of that woman when I think of this woman, because if you remember the, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, after, after he, she had had this encounter with Christ, she ran, left her bucket at the well, and ran down that hill saying, let me tell you about a man that's told me everything that I've ever done. And I often wonder if this, uh, if this woman had something similar. We don't know. The historical events of this, uh, of this time is over with just in a moment. We never know how it impacted her life. But I do know this. When she left there, she knew what forgiveness was about. And uh, if you ever really capture forgiveness you'll have a, long, a very, very difficult time being haughty. You'll have a very diffi difficult time being with your nose up in the air. And you'll, re you'll be reminded of the mercy of Christ it took to save you. And, and when we get to that point, no doubt the Lord is well pleased and we certainly understand our position and we could be of a greater help and a greater compassion for those people that stand outside of Christ. Verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them saying. So he frees this woman. And this is key. He goes back to somebody. Then spake Jesus. Now who had left and who was still there? Because uh he didn't say, where is everybody? He said, where is thine accusers? Sadducees and the Pharisees. His little class, his little group that he had when this was at the beginning was apparently still there because immediately he turned around and started talking to them and teaching them thing, the things of God. You know what? They had seen a glorious example, had they not? You know, when I, when I was teaching what I found and... Uh, I still have students that text me today and on Facebook and stuff and said you were the most gifted clinical teacher I ever had. Now, they didn't say much about my lecturing, so I guess y'all are stuck with that portion. Uh, but they make this statement. It was so simple and easy when you explained it. And that, that's, it wasn't because of me. You know what it was? It's because they had seen it. They had seen it transpire with their own eyes and they understood and they saw forgiveness firsthand. And if you're really saved, you have too. And what we need every once in a while is just a good reminder of how vile and ugly we were. And all these individuals saw the spiritual elite walk away at the, at the few words of Christ, where is thine accusers? And, and, and so we see, we can learn a lot by just watching, can we not? We can learn a lot by just listening. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me, follows me shall not walk in darkness, but, ha but shall have the light of life. Now, I'm going to make a couple comments there and we're going to close, but I want you to see, uh, I hear it and I say it myself time and time again. We're in a dark day, but we don't have to walk in the dark. Now, sometimes we choose to, uh, but what, what th this very same gospel, what does it begin, the John 1-1? I'm the light of the world. So if we have our mind on Christ, if we have our heart and our eyes fixed on Christ, there's nothing that can't be accomplished. There, there's nothing that can't be done. There's nothing. Uh, the, there's no risk because we'll see what's coming. And I want you to see that message of the light of the world was not for the Jews, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. It was for people who understood forgiveness. That, that wonderful illustration that they heard and saw of the forgiving, of what then was considered one of the greatest sins, I no doubt it left a mark on them. It, it, it made something that, that they couldn't tell the grandbabies about. And so, 
This evening, what we need to think upon is how we present. Are we a Pharisee? Are we a Sadducee? And the only real difference between them is one believed in the resurrection, the other did not. But they both were such righteous people that had opinions on everything. Or are we like that simple group that learned forgiveness by watching? If you've been saved, you know that. Sometimes we forget, but we know it. 